repeater. What are your plans for like the UHF repeater pair that you have? That is. That's the plan. To, to go, it's going to be a mixed <laughs> mode, so it'll be either both, either or. Do you have a uh, duplexer for it or anything like we that? We do have a duplexer. It's it's probably not the most exciting duplexer you've ever seen, but it does have three cans to it. What do you want to do for mixed mode? Are you talking about like analog and DMR? Are you talking about right. multi digital? Or? Right, analog DMR. We'll take a break here in a, I don't know, a few minutes. Surprisingly enough, I have a couple of friends of mine that went out to North Carolina and picked up a truckload of DMR repeaters. Really? So if you guys want one, we'll we just do. We do. We'll be you a We do. We do. We'll, we'll pick anything. We, right. we, we definitely do. It's free. <laughs> Okay, so that's the trick. It's not a repeater is never free. <laughs> never ever. <laughs> the equipment is the cheapest part. It's never ever free. It's the tower side and everything else that costs money. Yeah, and the setup. And yeah. And yeah. We we are lucky and have most of everything we need to. to the put duplex it in. is the big thing. Yeah. If you have one of those, it works. Yeah. Um, and it does work. So. Okay. I actually have several UHF duplexers. We've got some little tiny ones for lower power stuff, like at 25 watts. I saw those. Those are yeah. cheap. Aren't those adorable? Yeah. yeah. And they work those fine. They'll work fine up to yeah. 25, 30 watts. Mm -hmm. But we do have something better, so. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and get started then. And they're supposed to send me a text message here when they get close. They're out of Portland a few minutes ago on the call, so we'll kind of pay attention to that. <coughs> Yeah, they called me from Van Buren and said, where are you going to be in a couple hours? I said, I'm going to be in Sprinkle, but you won't be here in a couple hours. <laughs> so, They're in Van Buren? They were, yeah. No, oh. in Portland. They thought they'd be here 30 minutes ago. I said, it's going to be longer than that. No. So, all right, my name is James Atkins. For those who don't know me, KB0 and HX. And uh, I talked to Rodney, I guess the back of the campus, mm -hmm. about doing a DMR presentation at some point. This isn't... If you've been to any of the other presentations, this isn't going to be exactly the same as what we've done um, at any of the, the Nixa Club or at the Ham Fest. This is totally different. Um, there will be some things are the same just because there's a, a baseline that everybody needs to know, so we'll cover that a little bit. And if you have any questions, just stop along the way and we'll try to try to nail down something. And if you act up like Lance back there, I got this laser point. <laughs> so I'll just point the laser at you. Or Rodney if you're I'll try not to get in your eyes here. <laughs> All right, this is my uh, my little introduction here. I got my ticket in '94 when I was in high school. Bob Watts is my owner. He passed away just uh, about two years ago, and I've been messing with electronics and repeaters for quite a bit, uh, probably for about 20 years to that. So I've worked. I've built the analog repeaters, obviously Fusion, P25, DMR. I, it's kind of you know everybody has their aspect of the hobby. Some people like to contest. Whatever. I like to build repeaters. Uh, so that's, that's what I do. I've worked for the Eye Control uh, for about 20 years. Maybe actually 19. Be 20 in May. And my job is I maintain our low band repeater network on 42 megahertz, and then our trunking system. So what is DMR? This is kind of a uh, this would be our base we start at. If you know anything about P25, that's like the digital standard that public safety uses in the United States. DMR is P25 in the rest of the world. I think of it as P25 is inches and feet, DMR is meters and centimeters. So that's one reason why the cost is lower than P25. But amateurs and commercial users both use DMR, it's perfectly legal. When people started using DMR first, there were some questions of whether or not it was legal to use on the handband or not. So that has all been taken care of, and FCC is okay with it. One thing to look for on your DMR radios is you'll see some of these radios are tier one. <coughs> that is like the first level of DMR. And uh, I'll get into the two time slots later, but T TDMA is tier two. That's where you have two conversations on one frequency at the same time. Because if you ever listen to a DMR radio on your scanner, you'll hear it on and off, on and off. So if you're on time slot one, it's on and then off, on and then off. If you're on time slot two, it'll be off and then on. So you can actually carry on two conversations at the same time. The problem with tier one is it's not like that. It's, it's FDMA, kind of like D-Star or Fusion or P25. It's one conversation on your repeater at a time. So if you get a tier one radio, 
uh, if you try to use it on the repeater, it's not going to work that well. So just be careful. Like some of the Bofang radios that are DMR, they're tier one. So you don't. You just have to be really careful to look at the, the specs. Is it tier one or tier two? Uh, tier three is DMR trunking. I don't know if we'll ever get into that with amateur radio, but who knows? There's a lot of manufacturers for DMR radios. Uh, Connect Systems, I have one of their mobiles. They make portables. Uh, TYT, I've had their portables, I've got their mobile. Uh, of course, you have your commercial dealers, Motorola, Kenwood, uh, Tate. Anytone, you see, I saw Rodney had his Anytone up here. That's kind of the new uh, gold standard right now in the DMR world. You see Kenwood up here. Has anyone seen a, a DMR Kenwood amateur rig yet? No. But they make commercial radios. So <coughs> I, I hope that maybe they'll kind of see the light at some point start making them DMR. And, and, uh, I've only seen the handhelds, and I've, I've never seen one in person. I've seen them on the associated radio side for about $400. Oh, yeah, there, that's about I've, right. I've never actually seen one in person yet. I know I've seen the one that's supposed to do E Star or something like D-Star. NXDN, I think. Yeah. That's it. Oh, you've seen, you're talking about the uh, Tri Band Portable, the D71, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. Now, NXDN will not work on regular amateur uh, If you have an NXDN repeater, it will, but it's not no, compatible no. with anything else. Yeah. Because it's, it's like so frequency dependent. Yeah. Just like D Star. Very like. Time slot. That was a hard thing for me to grasp when I first started dealing with time slots and DMR was the whole time slot. Uh, to understand that you know you can be on the same, if you're on the same repeater, you have to be on the same time slot and the same talk group. But if you're on the same talk group on a different repeater, you can be on the, a different time slot. Doesn't matter. So DMR uses the same codec chip as D-Star and Fusion, which I always thought was interesting. But it uses less bandwidth, so you can see where all your all your ham stuff is generally wideband, 25 kilohertz, channel spacing 5 kilohertz deviation. DMR is six and a quarter kilohertz, and then 12 and a half bandwidth for the whole channel. So when you have two time slots in there, six and a, six and a quarter each, then you split that in half. So it's it also already meets the FCC's next uh, mandate for narrow banding, which they haven't announced a date for yet. Amateur radio is exact. So here's where we talk about the two time slots. Time slot one's on, two, one, two. So you can be on the red time slot one talking, and then someone else can be on the other time slot two. Uh, one of the big benefits, and I've noticed this, and I didn't really think about it until I started using DMR, was your battery life on your handheld radio. Because you're only on and off, you're transmitting literally half the time. So it's. Uh, it does make a big difference. I, mean, I guess you've seen a deer radio, the battery life. I can go like four or five days on that battery. So it's, that's, that's, a, and that's a good thing to know. Like if you're uh, working with Aries on a bike ride or the, you know, the, the MS, if they were using DMR, that'd be a, a good benefit to use that. So some people say digital has better range. I always thought that was a bunch of baloney uh, until we actually use the digital. And this is the best graph I could really find to represent it. Where you can see your analog system, you know, here's your half a microvolt or minus 114 dB. This is 20 dB sine ad. That's a signal that has just a little bit of static. Then you start getting down to 12 dB, which is, uh, has a lot of static, but you can generally still copy. When you look at DMR out here, and you're still, you have all this extra coverage because the DMR signal is like your cell phone. Basically, it either works or it doesn't. There's no like HF where you can, pull, you know, someone can hear better than someone else. They can pull a station out better on field day. It's it's not like that with DMR. The best I can describe it is if you're using a digital mode on your HF radio and you're sitting there watching your display and you're like, oh, I hear static, but your computer is decoding someone. So that's the best way I can describe uh, the voice on DMR versus analog is with that HF uh, correlation. So when you're on DMR, like I said, you're either 100% quieting or you're, you're not there at all. Uh, R2-D2, everybody, anybody remember the old term R2-D2 that everybody talked about with D-Star when we first put the repeater up? Uh, DMR doesn't really have that 
problem as much because they their codec uses they call it forward error correction, which to me is like how does it know what the next bit's going to be? But it actually goes through and it can rearrange the bits when you have a marginal signal and put it back together so you don't get the digitized voice as much. I'm not saying that you won't get digitized voice, but it's a lot less than what we experience with D-Star. So if you've looked anything at, at uh, DMR, has anyone heard of DMR Mark or, or Brandmeister? All right. So. MARC stands for Digital Mobile Radio. When DMR first got started, it was something that the Motorola Amateur Radio Club put together. They would not allow any other repeaters on their network unless you had a Motorola repeater. Um, they use what's called a C-Bridge. C-Bridge, an interesting piece of trivia. The C-Bridge was designed by John Rayfield. So all over the world, and he's here in Springfield, Missouri. So. Uh, the reason he designed that is because the Motorola built their repeaters that only allow so many connections on a network. Well, this allows you to have more. It basically extends that so you can have more. So the Mark network uses the C bridge, and John Rayfield's DMR repeater. I think it's 442.675, maybe. It's a Mark repeater, DMR Mark. It's the only one that we have in Springfield that's on the Mark network. It was the first, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, one of the, uh, these are just, to me, these are some of the disadvantages of it. Uh, when the repeater is set up, basically the user, the repeater sets the time <coughs> slots and they tell you what's available and there's no, I mean, basically you can't change it on, as an end user. And it's 442375, I got that wrong. Uh, because all the programming that takes place with the C bridge, uh, basically, on the Mark network, you tell the repeater owner tells the uh, their server, "I want these Todd groups available on my repeater," and that's how it works. So if you try to key up on a Todd group that's not available on a Mark repeater, it's not going to work. So Brandmeister came along. It started in Europe, um, and it really kind of started taking off probably two years ago now. It allows any DMR repeater, so you can have a homebrew repeater with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, as your controller, or you can buy a High Terror repeater, or a Kenwood repeater, or whatever repeater you want, it will work. You don't have to have a C bridge. The C bridges are about $1,500, $2,000. So that's another benefit of not going with the Mark uh, connection. And then Brandmeister offers some redundancy as well. Uh, there's four servers in the US alone that the repeaters will generally connect to. And they also allow the hotspots. I don't know, Rodney was talking about a hotspot. Does anyone know what a hotspot is on the DMR network? I've seen videos of them. So basically, uh, you, it's like having a, a simplex repeater at your house. Radio Shack used to sell simplex repeaters. I don't know if you remember seeing those or not. But you said it looked like about the size of a handheld radio, and you were on simplex and it repeated back out. Yeah, that's the best way I can uh, probably compare it. You, you program in a simplex channel and your DMR portable, and you basically have connection to any talk group on the network. So, you know, I was talking about on the, the mark repeaters, you have to have what you have to know how the repeater owner has their repeater set up. You have to program, you know, this talk group on this time slot. With Brandmeister, you know, we have certain talk groups that are static versus dynamic, and we'll talk about that a little more later. But say you want to use a talk group that's not available, like we don't have the Louisiana statewide talk group. You know, say Rodney has a cousin in Louisiana he wants to talk to. Well, he can program that talk group into his portable and get on your repeater on time slot, whatever time slot that you guys determine to use push talk activated uh, talk groups, and they can communicate. On the Mark network, you couldn't do that. You'd have to call John Rayfield and say, hey, you know, I'd like to have the Louisiana Statewide Talk Group. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know. But that's the benefit of Brandmeister is you don't have to worry about that. Just be aware once you get it set up, you will probably get emails. People traveling through say, hey, I want to use your repeater one in Springfield. Can I use Talk Group XYZ? And you're going to say yes or no. If you say yes, just please use time slot one or time slot two. Yeah. No. These hotspots. Um, but as I understand it, and correct me, please. 
some of them allow you to use the IP to get to the server, and that way you don't try to figure out the computer. Is that not right? That's how it works, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you get you that ties to your internet connection at home, or your hotspot on your cell phone, or McDonald's Wi Fi. So you can go straight into Brandmine Street through that, <laughs> from, to a Brandmine Street server. Exactly. Okay. And the, the hotspots aren't just DMR either. Yeah. No. They'll do P25 and no. Fusion and yeah. DSR and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I think probably one of the biggest thing is a lot of people back when the DMR, or I should say Brandmeister, really started getting into the Top Group 3100 and 310, mm -hmm. TAC 310, everybody gets on there. And mm -hmm. if it is tied to the whole group, it's you tied up your, your repeater. I think Chuck has even said they've had a few repeaters just burnt up because they've just continuously been on and never had a chance to, to rest. So having the hotspot allows you to key in on that particular uh, top group without tying up your repeater and messing up. You know. yeah. You're getting me on a soapbox, but that's okay. <laughs> that's one of the things that turned me off on D-Star is, you know, when we first put the D-Star repeater up, I guess, years ago, and there's always traffic from all over the world coming in on it. And I could never talk to anyone I knew locally because, you know, Pablo in Venezuela was talking to whoever in the Philippines, <laughs> and I couldn't call Rodney to have a local QSO. And it was like that 24 hours a day because, you know, it's worldwide. And they yeah, talk fast and nonstop, don't yeah. they? Yeah. So <laughs> when you do the PTT to, uh, to, like, tell the repeater that you want a different top group, uh -huh. Is there like a timeout, like so many minutes? And there is, and that's that's adjustable on the okay. on the Brandmeister dashboard. But it's the default's 15 minutes. And then another question I had was, I've seen that you can do text messaging. How does that work? You press with DTMF and like it's like using a flip phone. So yeah, it is <laughs> like yeah. DTMF. Too. Okay, yeah, it's not very user friendly. Yeah. Now you can also, if you have a Motorola radio, you can program buttons on it to send like a generic message, like. Okay, I'll see you yeah. then, or it just pops whatever. Screen, like it yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Or if, if you uh, do like a guy I saw doing it the other day, his radio didn't have a keypad on it, so he was using a tone generator on his cell phone <laughs> to punch in a DTMF message to send a text message over the radio. It was exceedingly <laughs> convoluted. <convoluted. laughs> like a cure. He's like using a cure, kind of like a. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> no voice control. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, back on this, I want to, before I forget it, uh, on the APRS, this is another thing about Grandmeister that's happened in the last year. Uh, you know, we've started using the APRS for bike rides and such. The Grandmeister repeaters support APRS, so you can, basically it's a checkbox in the software, and you tell it what top group you want to send the APRS information, because a lot of these radios have GPS built into them, and it'll <coughs> key up and send you a location, and it'll show up on APRS.fi. So, you know, a fraction of the cost of one of the Kenwoods that has, you know, $700 radio with a TNC built into it. I will say the new 878s that just came out, they have a TNC built into them. So you can use, nice. do analog APRS or use the DMR APRS. And they're still like two, 220 I think, is the street price on them right now. Still way cheaper than the other ones. So these are, right now, these are the Missouri TOT groups that are used. Uh, out of these, uh, Southwest Missouri is the one that gets used the most here. Uh, St. Louis is just kind of starting to get active. I've heard some chatter on it. Missouri statewide, is the, the net, they have the net every Monday night on there. And then BYRG is probably the busiest maybe in the United States, but it's technically it's the Kansas talk group. That's the backyard repeater group. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the ones that are uh, really kind of got the ball rolling with EMR in Missouri, I would say. There was a few pioneers like John when he put his repeater up. But when Grandmeister started, it was the guys up in Kansas City uh, that kind of got everything really rolling on it. So that's a really active talk group. There's a lot of people like to listen to that talk group. It's static on a lot of repeaters around town, Cox South, Ozark, uh, Branson, uh, Bolivar, Con. It's static on a lot of repeaters. And we initially, we weren't going to make it static on like Branson because we, we made like the Brain Center Talk Group static and then uh, Southwest Missouri and Southwest Missouri Skywarn static. Those are static on all the repeaters around here, um, which is kind of nice. I'll get on a rabbit trail here because on the Skywarn Talk Group, Brad, K0KDW was on 
uh, this last severe weather net, and he was reading off the information on the DMR talk group. And I'm sitting on the basement, I can't hear the 4-9 or anything. But I got my handheld, listen to my hotspot, listen to him on Southwest Missouri Skyline. <laughs> so it actually worked out pretty well. That's another benefit of DMR is all of a sudden you're not just reliant on a couple of repeaters. Now you can be wherever on your hotspot and have access. You would be driving down the highway spotting and be on the top group with the hotspot hooked to your cell phone. So a lot of benefits there. So how do you get started? This has changed a couple times. But this is the the most current information I've found. I just had to get another DMR ID recently for a repeater, and this is where I went to. Radio ID <coughs> on that. Do so, you have to have a radio before you can do that? No, sure don't. You can go apply for one right now. They don't, uh, best I can tell, they don't do a whole lot of uh, canceling from inactivity. I've not heard of that yet. I'm sure the day will come at some point. Uh, is it kind of a similar process to like getting an echo link sign in? You just have to like provide uh, some information, prove you're a ham, and no, you don't yeah, you have, have to really prove you're a ham. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just basically you only put your name and your call sign, and then after so long they'll come back and send you an email and say, hey, this is your you've got an ID assigned to you. Log in and get it. Okay. You do have to register, make an account, give them all your information up front. Mm -hmm. They always say you know three days. Usually it's within a few hours, but you know how that works. Uh, you only need one DMR ID. When DMR first got started, people were getting a DMR ID. I want one for my mobile, my portable, my phone, the base station, <laughs> and the trash truck I drive every day. You know, you don't need that. You just need one. So, and that's another nice thing about, I have, you know, it's a DMR ID for the hotspot, same thing in my portable, same thing in my mobile. It's all the same. And the reason for that is, you know, some radios you have to load a database into it, and when the, whenever someone talks, it shows up their call sign, what talk group they're on, um, all sorts of information, which is really handy if you don't recognize the voice or if someone's deciding they want to be malicious and cause problems. But like, oh yeah, I know who that is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've not seen anyone spoofing an ID yet, so I'm but sure there's nothing to stop you from doing. But if you don't have the contact loaded into your radio, did you show the number? Yep. It depends. Um, the 685 repeater, it's a, a, a Pi Star repeater. Basically, it's a homemade repeater. It does what they call talker alias, which really surprised me one day because all of a sudden I'm sitting here thinking, as I had a new radio, I hadn't done anything to it yet. It's like a caller, do you look up kind of? And it's, and it's showing me the ID and the name of the person and where they're at. I was like, how is this even happening? So I called Chuck. I said, Chuck, how's this work? He's like, oh, you're on your Pi Star repeater. Okay. Is that, is that the, the Mark only or the Brand Meister also? Brand Meister only. Yeah. It's, it's issued by the, it's issued by this radio ID.net. Um, there, there was another group that was issuing the IDs and they had a big I don't I don't know the whole story. But they basically someone they decided they weren't gonna do it anymore, so this other group picked it up. So it's a different website than it used to be on there. It's a little bit different. You know how hand call signs it used to it was a zero, you knew they're from the Midwest, or six was from Southern California. Brand Meister used to be the same way. If you're in Missouri, it always started with 3129. Well, now they decided there's some states that there's more than a thousand people that have their DMR ID. So they just started going back. Because you go to like Montana, there's like 50 people. Yeah. So now they're starting to, you might get a Montana, or whatever they're free for. So when you get started, uh, one of the big things to consider is what you know. What radio are you using? If you're using a TYT radio, it has kind of the uh, you know 16 channels per zone basically. So you got to kind of figure out how you're going to program your radio. If you use one of the AnyTone radios, there, you don't have to worry about that. That's one one reason I didn't like the earlier DMR radios because you have that limitation of 16 <laughs> channels. You're not turned 16 times. That's all you got. You have to make a new zone. So. Just keep in mind what radio you have and start thinking about how you want to organize your programming. Another thing that I found out is your zones. You can name your zone with six characters on the TYT and it won't scan. So that's why I came up with like, for Ozark, OZK775. I know it's a 775 in Ozark. However you want to do it, that's how I did it. Because I didn't like it scrolling across because if someone's talking, I didn't want it to scroll the, the repeater and all this other stuff. 
Uh oh. I'll get him from the other board. Yeah. Is that one locked? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I got a text that says beep two minutes ago. <laughs> uh, what about the Yasu radio? The Fusion. Those do, are not DMR capable. It is digital, but it's not compatible. So I hope you have Fusion, Fusion radio. radio. If you have a hotspot, if you have a fusion radio, you can tell it to do YSF to DMR, and it'll you can use your fusion radio on DMR that way. Hmm. I was going to ask you earlier, with the DMR mark and Brandmeister, are there some top groups that are interchangeable between the two? Or does, I is think that where the like reflectors came into play. Yeah, I mean there's some that will patch patch them together. I don't know off the top of my head what they are. Oh, okay. But I do know there are some that are tied and some of that gets frowned upon pretty quickly. <laughs> like echo link to DMR, people don't like that. You <laughs> 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 yeah, can ask Brad about that, he'll tell you all about it. Because he wanted to tie in an echo link conference server to the DMR net on Mondays and he got a lot of not from around here, but <laughs> a lot of people around the state, nope, nope. We, we heard you like to have your <coughs> repeater tied up constantly, so we yeah. decided to tie these two networks together yeah. for you. Yeah. Let <laughs> me tie in everything. Oh, you're right. <laughs> but I, I say that just to make sure everybody understands that you need to make sure when you're programming your radios, these are just some things to think about. Is know how many characters you can have on your display at once. This, the scrolling thing was new to me because anytime you program Yasu, it's like, oh, you're six characters and you know that. But these are all different. Come on in, Dave. Did you bring anything? Me? Besides you? Yeah. Where's Lee? Is he out on the... He, he pulled the truck around the door. Okay. <coughs> so you want me to come uh, out there real quick? Uh, you're in trouble too. Pardon? You got a laser pointer here. I'll get you in trouble too. <coughs> That's Dave, W0DR. Have you ever heard of him? Out of here, buddy. Hello? Hello. Hello. You guys want to bring those in real quick? Or? That's a few. The whole I think you better come and see what you're getting. <laughs> 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 you want to take a quick break real quick? Oh, sure, that's yeah. Put my coat on. I'll sit off the road. Cool, let's smoke it in. We're gonna go out and if you go to the uh, like um, associated radio or
programming and all this. On that one, you have to actually load the database. So basically, you do a computer and then drop it down into the phone. Yeah. Well, the thing is, what he just showed as far as a memory of signal and the fact that it was automatically brought back and
if you can program Yeah, you don't do that. 
Guys, I'm gonna get started again. So we get her by here before the freezing rain starts getting oh, oh, the freezing rain. rain. Plus me. <laughs> yeah. That's almost like the word. Yeah. <laughs> freezing rain. Whoa. Tornadoes. I need to go. Tornadoes. Uh, how much do you want me to cover on the actual programming of the radio? Because I have some slides on that. I'm not sure that's really what you're looking for. I can kind of breeze through it, or we can spend more time on it. Uh, I don't know how many people I here already have DMR radios that have questions about programming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a fusion radio. What? You've got a fusion got radio. Oh, no, you've got the fusion radio. I've got his radio. Okay. <laughs> He's got a TYT. Okay. So, so breeze through it. We'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. <laughs> I'll ask them, go on. No, no, we'll talk about it a little bit. I'll show, I've got some screenshots of the TYT software, actually, so that might be helpful. So, this is for you, Dave. Yeah, so I'll, try, I'll kind of try to cover this. So all this stuff I'm talking about, like, name, links, and everything that applies specifically to TYTs only, because I'm not really kind of so much of the any tones, which really is kind of my favorite at this point. That's uh, subject to the next good thing coming along, I guess. The one thing that really I had a hard time grasping too was when you're programming the, the radio and you have a zone of 16 channels, you're going to want maybe all those 16 channels might be the same frequency. And the only thing that's going to be different is the digital contact of the top group. So say 444.400, that's going to be, you want to program in the, that as one zone. So every channel will be 444.400 with color code 5, because that's the color code, or color codes of PL tone and DMR, basically. And then all you're going to do is assign Southwest Missouri, Branson, Local 2, Local 9, all these different talk groups. That way, every channel in, your, in that zone will be the same frequency and color code, but it'll be a different talk group. So there, there is a specific order that you want to do this in. So, and I'll give you, if you want this presentation, if people want it, they can have it later, so you can go back and refer to it. Okay. But you want to go, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create your talk groups, your digital contacts. All right, that's the, before you can do anything else, you need to do that. All the talk groups are group calls, and so the only private call is the parrot. The parrot is when you key up your radio and you say, KV0 and HX testing. You unkey and it spits it back to you so you know that you're making the repeater if you want to do that. It's handy if you have a hotspot and you want to set your audio levels. So this is what it looks like in the TYT software. It's, it's real simple. You have your contact name. This doesn't show up on your radio. This can be whatever link you want. It's a group call. And this is your talk group number. And then the call receive tone, that's just beeps at you if you want to beep at you whenever a call comes in on a talk group. I thought it was annoying, so I leave it shut off. Digital receive groups, this has kind of changed since the beginning. Uh, there's some radios like the Radioddities that you had to have an individual receive group for every channel on the radio, which is really annoying. Uh, the TYTs, I don't, I never use this with the TYTs. But basically, the gist of it is, it's kind of like, kind of like scanning. So if you're set on a certain channel, you can say, okay, well, I'm on this channel, I want to receive all these talk groups. So you can be sitting on 444, 400 until you want to receive Southwest Missouri, 
uh, South Missouri Skywarn, Region D, whatever. That's what a digital receive group is. Only you're not actually scanning between channels. It's just listening for that top group on a frequency. So then you want to create scan lists. If you want to do any scanning, which I don't do any scanning on DMR for two reasons. Number one, you have the digital receive groups. And number two, uh, on the Anytones, there's something called digital monitor or dual time slot monitor. So if you're on, the, on your local repeater, <coughs> if you just go into monitor mode, you're going to hear every talk group that comes across your repeater. So I don't use scanning at all. I don't like scanning on DMR. I don't think it works that well. Now, if you're scanning between different re repeaters, like if you want to scan between Ozark and your local repeater here, then you might want to scan because there could be different things. So then you can scan and be in monitor mode, and then you can be really confused. <laughs> okay, what, yeah, what talk group was it on? What repeater was it on? So you don't really need to actually, since you haven't created any channels yet, you're just creating a scan list because when you make your channels, you have to assign it to a scan list. So it's easier to have those created beforehand. This is what the scan list looks like. You can see over here, um, this, they call this the tree. You can see the scan list that I had at the time when I made this. Um, this is something important too, when you set your scan list up. You can tell what you want to do when it receives someone talking. You want to transmit on the last active channel. So if you're listening and you're scanning a whole bunch of channels and it comes up on Arizona statewide, when you key your mic, do you want to talk back on Arizona statewide? Or you want to talk on the channel that you're on. So if you want to be able to talk back on the last active channel, like Arizona, then you set to that. If you want to, when you push the button, you want to know you're talking on the channel you're selected on, then you put a selected channel there. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, that caught me because it defaults to that, and I think I don't like that either. So, but you know, different people like different things. And we kind of talked about this already. Uh, so 443, 400 is the Cox South repeater frequency. So you're going to put that in as your uh, receive frequency. 448.400 is your transmit. You're going to select the scan list. Set your timeout timer. I always use a default to three minutes. I don't ever usually talk longer than that at a time. So a lot of repeaters are set to three minutes. That's another reason why I set it to that. You're going to set your admit criteria. That's just something new. We'll talk about that a little bit to color code. That's kind of like setting your analog radio to CTCSS or full decode. Uh, it's not going to allow you to talk unless uh, the color code's free or your, your CTCSS is free. <coughs> Go look at it that way. And here's what it looks like in your programming window. This is the TYT software, but the AnyTone software looks pretty similar to this. And actually most of these radios look similar to this. So it's, you have your digital, you're set to digital channel. <coughs> You select your scan list. This is where the, the characters comes in is important is you know you have nine characters so you set to Southwest Missouri, whatever. Your frequency, your color code, timeout timer. And over here is where you have the important DMR stuff. Your contact name. And this is another thing that is a pet peeve of mine. They call it digital contacts at one point in the software. Then they just call it contacts here. And then another place they call it talk groups. Can you just call it the same thing and, and, call, and be good with it? No. So contact name is your talk group. Your color code, again, that's your PL tone. And then your time slot is your repeater slot is what they call it on this software. It's going to be one or two. Same thing, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Rodney. So you, had, you were talking about the TOT, the timeout. Uh -huh. Does DMR repeaters time out the same way the analog repeaters do? Like if you go, if you talk too long, will it eventually just they're set up that way, yeah. It's just like an analog repeater, you don't have to have a timeout timer. But they're all defaulted to 100. All of ours are 180 seconds. So, all right, Frank, then you're going to have to talk. Talk fast. Hey, at least it's longer than what's on the 9-1. Yeah, get in, get it over there. We had to go to HF last night because, you know. Therefore, you can ramble on and go on the other talk group. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of already covered this on that last slide. This is just. Um, saying what I already told you. Um, the color codes, just like PL tones, there's a, the Missouri map is set up, they split it in different regions, and five is the color code that we use in Southwest Missouri. Uh, the reason for that is because there's a 443-400 in Kansas City, and if we have the same color code as them, 
during a band opening, it could create problems, so we use different color codes. Analog channels are very similar. The one gotcha on this is you want to make sure you change that from 12.5 to 25. And this is the same thing whether you're talking about a Bofang or anything. Uh, people get on the repeater on analog and their audio is really low. And it's like, are you on a Bofang? Are you on this radio or that radio? Yes. If your audio is really low, can you go in and set your bandwidth from 12.5 to 25? And that fixes it every time. Because these radios, some of them are part 95 accepted and it requires narrow band operation. We don't use narrow band in ham radio on analog, just digital. Uh, one of the things you'll see here on the analog side, all the digital stuff's grayed out. So that'd be your, if you don't know whether you have a digital channel or not, then that'd be a, a big cue because you can't do anything with it. So you'll still address these issues here. You'll, you'll change that to analog, you'll change that to 25 kilohertz. And the rest of it's the same, except in all you always put always for your criteria. And then down at the bottom, this was grayed out before on the DMR channel. Now it's not. You can put in your PL tone on encode and decode. I've got a question on the low that since I've got the 2017. Uh -huh. um, there's a checkbox, maybe it doesn't show it on this one, but there's a checkbox right below that that says reverse first. Uh -huh. What is that about? Reverse burst, and you can see QT reverse here, uh -huh. 180. The other one's 120. <coughs> uh, what that does is that reverses the, uh, I don't know, it's not really the polarity, but on your PL tone, it inverts it so you don't hear any static after you unkey. Okay. And there is a standard for that. Uh, 180 is your general uh, Motorola reverse burst, and uh -huh. 120 is everybody else. So, you know, on an analog repeater, the repeater has to kind of be set up too. So like the 6.4 and the 9.1 are both Motorola repeaters, so you want to set it to 180. Uh, but if you don't know what the repeater is, you can take a guess if you really, you know, are concerned about it. But that's all that is. So you can either turn it on or off, and then you set whether you want it for what type of system. That's what I was wondering, because I didn't know whether that needed to be checked in, in the code book or if it's not checked, it's going to be like every amateur radio on the market. Only commercial radios generally have that option. So. Okay. okay. It, it's theoretically as quiet. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't have the squelch. You don't hear the when you unkey. When you unkey. Well, that's why I was going to get ready to ask then. So is that reverse burst? Is that similar to like a, a tone squelch on an analog radio? Or? That is, well, that's what that is exactly. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, this, yeah. uh, this wouldn't be available on a DMR channel. This is just analog only. So yeah, um, it's exactly the same thing. And it's debatable whether it actually works real well on the too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I will have to say, uh, last night on the 9-1, uh, I was getting concerned because it was cutting it off so quickly on my 27-30, I wasn't for sure I was making it through off the repeater. Yeah. Because I heard nothing. Simplex. So if you want to talk simplex, and I've done this a couple times just because we wanted to try it, don't use the standard 146.5.2 or 446 calling channels. If there's other people actually using those, they won't be very happy about it. I don't know if you've read lately, some people are complaining about people setting up their hotspots on the satellite subband, and they're trying to work satellite, and they're hearing DMR traffic. So just, you know, and I have the people argue will argue about this. Well, this isn't an FCC rule. No, but it's the band plan. It's the gentleman's agreement. You should probably go by it just to make sure people don't get mad. Makes sense if you got like four yeah. elements. And the selectors, there's, there's a lot of frequencies, <laughs> right? So I mean, these are the, your standard frequencies nationwide people are using for DMR, and it's always time slot one. It's always color code one, and the talk group is always 99. So that's pretty standard. <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, people have the 5-2 sticker on their cars now for Simplex Nationwide. I don't think anyone's going to be going around with a 5-10 anytime soon. But. You know, four four one KB, you never know. So what's the difference between digital talk around and Simplex? I mean, you're obviously on Simplex. If you're within range, you should be able to basically talk uh, handheld to handheld, right? right? My understanding is talk around uses the receive frequency on the repeater. Well, it's, uh, it's on the repeater output, so it'd be your repeater transmit frequency. Oh, okay. Yeah. Transmit. It'd be your portables, how your. The nice thing about talk around is you can still hear the repeater when it transmits. 
So you can talk simplex to simplex, you know, portable to portable on the repeater frequency, repeater output, and you're not interfering with the repeater operation, so you can still hear people if they come on to the, the repeater. It's, you're usually basically talking on simplex on the repeater transfer frequency, on top around. Does that cause a problem with the channel being used? No. Because the repeater's not going to carry it. Yeah, it might cause Lance a problem if you're next to his house and he's wanting to listen to the repeater and you're talking to someone down the street from him. He's like, I can't hear the repeater because Roger's on the output. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's really all you have to be concerned about. All right, so <laughs> this happened to me the first time I had a DMR radio. I have all these channels and everything in here. I'm like, okay, let's program the radio and go. But I didn't assign to any zones. It's not like, uh, you know, yes, dude, it's like, program the channels in one through whatever and you're good to go. Nope, you got to sign to a zone. The first time it comes, everything says unprogrammed, unprogrammed. Oh, I, I just spent five hours programming this radio. It's not unprogrammed. I have to add them to a zone. So, you can see here, this is the tree on the side here. You know, we've gone through making a scan list, setting up your channels down here, now you have your zones. And you're, it's real simple. This is all your available channels and you're going to add them to your zone over here. Just hit highlight it, select the add button, it shows up over here. Uh, the, the one bad thing about using the TYT or the Anytel software is once you do this, it's in that order, you can't change it. So you have to delete it and then whatever. But if you use Contact Manager, you don't have to do that. We'll talk about Contact Manager in a minute. It's a really neat piece of software. And this is the dual band version. Heather, you might be more familiar with this. This is what the 2017 and 9600 mobiles look like. You have your A, A side and your B side of your radio. And for anybody that has the dual band, if you want to make sure that the dual band will work on both channels, put your channels in both slots. Both slots, yep. Yeah. Because if, if you don't have it on both sides, you won't be able to use it on both sides. Yeah. So. So the way I'd set mine up is I would do on like A side, I'd have analog channels for the, the region I was wanting to cover, and B side, I'd have digital. So, so it's kind of like some of the uh, older dual band mobiles where you can only do one band on one side and the other band on the other. Yeah, I mean, you don't really have that limitation. Really, it's limited to what you put in it, though. Like a VFO AB. Yeah. Say again? Like a VFO AB. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, that was always annoying, too. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do that. So you're almost done. You're gonna break out your cable, right to your radio. Always save your code plug. That's just <laughs> common sense. It should be if it's not yet. Time that in your brain. Um, when your radio resets, you're ready to go. Uh, I've seen a couple of times where people will come on a repeater and talk to me, and they're on Southwest Missouri, and their radio ID says nine 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 nine. It's like I can't talk to anyone. Well, you need to put your DMR ID in. So 9999 is like the default, like factory default, and it won't go anywhere on the network. You can use your local <laughs> repeater all day long, but you won't talk to anyone on, on the network. So this is a little chart we put together that kind of compares the two, you know, frequency pair, an offset, 25 kilohertz on analog versus 12 and a half on digital. Uh, one full bandwidth slot on analog, you're on one frequency, you can talk to one person at a time. Uh, on digital you have two, you can have your talk groups, multiple time slots. Analog, or you might have a repeater, and in the DMR it's going to be a whole zone of the same repeater. You have your PL tones and DCS tones of analog, where you have color codes and DMR. And a lot of people get hung up on this whole code plug deal. I have these stupid DMR radios have a code plug. What do you think you're programming into your Yaesu radio? It's a programming file. It's the same thing. It's just code plug is what commercial people have been calling a file that goes in your radio for centuries or however long they've been doing it. Not centuries, decades. Uh, so think of it that way. When you make your configuration file with your RT system software, you're doing the same thing with the DMR radio. It's just the people call the code plug. So it, I, I guess you call it jargon. So. Uh, contact manager in zero GSG I created this. He lives up in Kansas City. It's I, it's kind of like Chirp for DMR, only it does a lot more. Uh, Chirp will actually brick your radio. DMR won't, or the uh, contact manager won't. And there's some radios I've read. One of the new Yasus, they say don't use Chirp with this radio because it will brick it. You have to send back to the factory. 
So the nice thing about Chirp, this is the absolute the best thing, the reason I started using it. I can say I had an MD380 portable and I buy the Anytone. Actually, I had the, the dual band 2017 like Heather has. I open that code plug in Contact Manager. I take a drop down men menu and take it from TYT 2017 to Anytone 868. Mm -hmm. Bam. Now it's an Anytone code plug and I can put it in my Anytone radio. So it does that for a whole bunch of different radios, connect systems, the TYTs, any tones, the ZAS tone, whatever. Uh, you can basically, it tells you what it's made in, what radio you read it from, and you take that, that drop down menu to whatever you want to make it. So yeah, there will be some changes you probably have to make, but it's not about saving some time, making it really easy. So it's free software, it actually works, which is kind of funny. Here's a list of radios that the contact manager supports. And I did go ahead and update this here right before the meeting, so this should be accurate. I have not seen anything new on it. So if you buy any of these connect systems, TYTs, Anytones, or Tevis, uh, it will work. There's the website. It's just the best software that I think I've had for any of this stuff. So there are some uh, downloads. We have a couple of code plugs on the groups.io website you can download so you might wonder how many DMR repeaters do we have around here already and compare this to how many other modes that we have uh, you see we have Bolivar, two in Branson the one at Clever is on the way Conway, Cox South, Joplin theirs is coming online pretty soon Missouri State University Neosho Two of the Osho, Nevada, Ozark, 685, and Springfield. That's the one that does uh, the multiple digital modes. And then this is another uh, neat chart that you'll find that'll help you program your radios. I don't know if you can see it very well in the back. Probably not, so I apologize. But this is on the Nixon Hams website, too. Um, so you know if you're on the Bolivar repeater on the 145.29. These talk groups are on there all the time. Southwest Missouri, Branson, and the Missouri Lakes talk groups. On time slot two, they have BYRG. So you kind of go down the list here, and you see on all these repeaters, Southwest Missouri, Southwest Missouri, and Skywarn, Southwest Missouri, and Skywarn. And then we have that broken out for all the repeaters in the region. So when you go to program your radio, that way you kind of know what to expect. And you notice you will not see Louisiana statewide on here anywhere. So you don't have realtors in Louisiana. Either. So with your talk groups, especially with the Southwest Missouri talk groups, does that go based on which repeaters you have in that But yes, it will be on both repeaters. Uh -huh. If it's static, you'll hear it. Okay. If it's like on the 685, it's not static. So if you key your mic on Southwest Missouri, it'll be there for 15 minutes. Uh -huh. But say if you're on Ozark and Cox South, uh -huh. you're gonna, you will, I don't know if how 2017 works, but it will be on both repeaters. Uh -huh. So well, when the, you, thing, the thing that I'm wondering though, like if you have this on, on the 775 on your, on your zone, and you have another one like on the call, so I have, on mine I have like 775 and constable runner uh -huh. on mine. Um, if you're on the 400, are you coming off of that repeater system? If you're on the 775, are you coming off of that repeater system? You mean like you're actually using it? Yeah. Yeah, if you're selected on that channel, you're using that repeater. Okay. But you're also going out onto the other repeater that that's static on okay. over the network. That's another misnomer. I don't know if I went the wrong way. <coughs> All right, so uh, let me get back to that. That's one of the misnomers about DMR is, well, if you lose internet, the repeater doesn't work. It does. It's just you're not linked up over the internet. Just you, like you if just you have, have the local echo communication. Right. You still you can talk to anyone. Just like a, like the nine one. You can talk to anyone that's on the nine one. Same thing. You can talk to anyone that's on your DMR repeater. It just doesn't go out of the internet. So, and there are talk groups on DMR, uh, local two and local nine, that are local only. Mm -hmm. So if you're on two, uh, you know, 
Steve can get on the dashboard and say, oh yeah, uh, Heather's been on local two for, I don't know, 20 minutes and she's talking to this person and this is her signal strength. But if you're on local nine, that doesn't show up anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's like a phantom talker, but it's local only. I don't know why they created that, but they did, so. Uh, there's a couple places also you get more DMR information, the Facebook page, Nixon Hams, and then the Facebook page for Missouri DMR Network. And actually, I'm kind of surprised. There's 147 people on the Missouri uh, DMR discussion list, and most of those are in Southwest Missouri because it started in Southwest Missouri DMR. So, pretty interesting. Yeah. James. Yes. Is there a version of this uh, like as a PDF file on Nixa Hams, or do you have one? I don't know. I can make one. You want to send one to you or whoever you can put it on the website? Yeah, that that way, because I it's been live, and so you know, the screen may not be that visible, and people may want to refer to it back to the Okay. So uh, I'll look and see if it's on. If it's anywhere, it's on the groups.io file section. So we put some of the presentations up there. Okay. But I don't think I haven't really done this one before, so it may not be up there. If you haven't, well, if you for some reason it can't be converted, just send me send me the okay. what you got, and I can convert it and we can put it okay. up. Okay. Because that's, that's a big helpful thing when you can actually look at page by page. Well, like if you're programming your radio, you may want to go back and say, well, I remember he said something about this. Now, what was that again? Then you can go through the PDF. Or right, PDF right. Or yeah, kind of reach as many as we can. <laughs> All right, I got a couple more and then I'm going to be done. But this is kind of, um, you know, everybody always asks, and I've heard this a million times, why DMR, why not D-Star or Fusion or NXD MP25? I'm not buying a digital radio because until everybody decides what it's gonna, what they're gonna do. Well, unless something changes, I don't think we're gonna be, there's gonna be any influx of D-Star or Fusion or P25 or NXDN around here. But this is the re this is my reasoning why, because I, I kind of dealt with this a little bit too. I held out on D-Star and Fusion and all that. So, you know, it's really kind of fluid. You know, we've had a D-Star or a Fusion repeater and, uh, uh, then D when DMR kind of made its turn and went to Brandmeister, these are the reasons why I decided DMR is probably going to be here to stay. First of all, they're made by multiple manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Fusion is Yaesu. D-Star is Icom, except for Kinlan has that $700 portable if you want to buy that. So for that reason alone, they're going to be cheaper. You know, you're not going to pay the premium you pay for a $500 <coughs> Fusion Mobile if you buy the FTM 400 or, you know, any of the other Fusion radios, the ICOM radios. These are going to be cheaper because they can sell it and more people make them as more of a competition. Another thing about DMR is it's also, there's commercial users, even public safety users. So what that means is they're going to continue to and evolve and change that over time. It's not just going to be like a, a dead standard. When was, I mean, has ICOM done anything with D-Star recently? Have they made any changes to it? So I, I mean, it's not you, really been changed since they launched it. And when was that? 99, 2000? 20 years ago almost? Yeah. yeah. So, Yesu has actually been making changes, which surprises me. They're making some changes, even though it's nothing that has really come out and struck me as being you know, this new version of the portable, instead of having their HRI 200, I can program a USB cable in now and I can have a hotspot with my handheld with no computer, or no uh, HRI 200 between it and my computer. Well, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? think, not on my good list right now. I, I think the only reason they got going for it on Fusion is that it does both. Yeah. The most of the time it's analog. Yeah. Every, everything besides uh, ICOM is dual mode. P25 well, and XDN, and it all can do mixed mode. And, and maybe I am incorrect, but I was thinking that on Fusion, one of the big selling points when it first came out, you could do voice or digital, but I thought there was a mode where you could do like some voice and digital at the same yeah, time. Yeah, digital and arrow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and another reason why, just like with that Motorola repeater back there, a lot of the best repeaters have come from commercial service. You know, think of your the 6.4 and the 9.1 or MSF 5000s. Those are made in the mid 90s, and they're still going everywhere. People are using the devil out, and they're bulletproof. Well, same reason 
a DMR repeater back there made by Motorola. Uh, if you ever look inside an ICOM or a Yaesu repeater, it's just a couple of ICOM mobiles or Yaesu mobiles. It's nothing spectacular. They add a bigger heat sink and put a fan on it. So you don't get any extra filtering like you do with the commercial repeaters. So that's another reason why I think that, well, another reason why DMR will probably continue to expand. And then DMR allows for two conversations at a, on a repeater at once with the two time slots. Everything else is one at a time. So one of the big things that we talk about is, you know, say you have a bike ride or you're doing storm spotting on DMR. You know, time slot one can be your, your primary operations for a bike ride and time slot two could be SAGs and, or everybody else. And you have the same coverage because you're on the same repeater. Whereas now you might, well, you know, we want the primary operations on the, this repeater and we want the SAGs or whatever on this repeater. Well, the coverages are going to be different because they're in different places. Well, now if you're using DMR, you have the same coverage because you're on the same repeater. That's another benefit of it. Now, and this, we already talked about this. You know, if you lose internet, you're not on the network. Uh, the guys that just brought the repeater down out uh, of Kansas City, they're building their own network and we could do this in Springfield. We could have our own you know LAN basically and connect the repeaters together with you know inexpensive uh, IP radio like ubiquity or something. So we don't have to have internet to make it work. Um, but it can be done. So that's that's the one thing I hear. Practical applications, Kyle already talked about this. I just actually just talked about that. I guess I got ahead of myself. Uh, so you notice Kenwood Vertex, Yaesu, they don't sell amateur radios that will do DMR, but they have commercial radios that will transfer on DMR. So why don't they make amateur rig for us? I don't know. They compete for their own stuff? Yeah. They'd be competing against what they already have, right? Yeah. And ICOM, as they came out with a press release, said they will never, ever, ever, ever make a DMR radio. So. Well, ICOM constantly shoots themselves in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> but the Chinese will. Yeah, all the way down. <laughs> They'll go where the money is. Uh, I guess Icon's making up money doing what they're doing. So, uh, Favorite DMR? Mine is that 868 like Rodney has, and the 878 just came out. Um, I, that's, that is the most ham-like DMR radio I've found yet. Their mobile radio dual band is supposed to be coming out. They're supposed to announce in March or April, uh, before Dayton, of course. And uh, that's what I'm holding out for. The nice thing about that radio versus the TYT, and I don't know, Heather, I never really took time to figure out the VFO mode. I actually, honestly, I can never figure it out on the <laughs> TYT. But on that, I just hit the button, it goes, I can choose VFO A or B, I type in my frequency, and then from there it's just a menu. I go down color code, hit select, change it to whatever I want, hit enter, go down, time slot, contact, and I'm on VFO, and then I can even save it to a memory channel. None of the other radios I don't think can do that yet. So to me, the any tone is more like what we're all used to. It's more like a Yaesu or a Kenwood or an Icom or a Linco or how about Asden? You ever had an Asden radio? I remember them, but I never owned yeah. ADI. <laughs> so. I wouldn't know if you would do it for Yeah. Now that any tone you're talking about right there, it'll do uh, dual. It does uh, dual band if that's dual what you mean. Yeah. yeah. VHO and UHF. Okay. And uh, analog and DMR. Does it come with program cable? Yes. So all you have to do is get a hold of that uh, object picture of what to go. Contact manager. Contact manager. Contact yeah. manager mm -hmm. And you don't have to download the driver to the cord. I had a you will have to do that, yeah. I uh, had a Valfang radio and come find out you had to buy a certain cord, do the driver for the cord, and then come to find out <laughs> yeah. the outside said 5R, but the inside was 8HP. Huh. That took a long time to figure that out. But you won't have that issue with the Anytones for sure. Um, yeah, when you download, you'll have to download the software from Anytones website or from Bridgecom or whoever your dealers you want to download it from. And they'll have, uh, like Bridgecom is really good about having the firmware, the latest firmware and the software. That's one thing you have to watch. But if you're on like 1.34 firmware, you want to use 2.34 software. If you're on 1.32, you want to use 2.32. So just make sure the numbers match up. With well, I guess does this cord when you get it, did it tell you to how to download the correct driver? Uh, no. You just go to their <laughs> website and download it. Okay. It's it's really simple. I mean, they'll have a folder for Anytone 868. You click on the folder and it has the program cable driver, 
and then it has the software, and then if you want to update your firmware, it has that. Okay, so that's probably about the best radio right now. To get. I think so. That or the 878. Uh, I don't know how long we keep selling the 868. Probably until they run out of stock, at least. Uh, but yeah, you, you still have to use their software to write, read and write to the radio, but you don't have to use it to build your code flux. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So it's a zone thing. Is it that hard to change the zone while operating? No. 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 I mean, I program mine. I've got the up, and the middle toggle there. I go up and down the zones. So it's just like kind of having like two, like give a memory for that, and then you have another. Kind of. I have one program on that. I think it's P2 on my radio. goes between A and B zone. That's how I programmed it. And then so I can go up or down. And then I can use the up down toggle in the middle for my zone change. Okay, because you were talking about how the zone thing. I didn't and that's the only thing about video, these radios. You can program your buttons to do whatever you want. Yeah, but I don't know if the zone limitation thing was that big of a deal or not. Not on the Anytones. It's not at all. How many channels can those hold anyway? Wouldn't like 150 or something per zone? I don't know. I've never. I'm not got that. No, I meant. I meant on radios that do have that limitation. Is oh, it really? That annoying? Or? Um, well, it depends on your operating. How many channels you want in the zone? Yeah. You know, if just 16 channels is enough, then no. But if I have two zones, it's hard to go between them. No. No. Nope. That's just. Yeah. The uh, TYTs would be the best example, and I don't remember Heather is that your 2017 is not limited to 16 channels of zone, is it? Not that I know of. I don't think so. Because uh, the twenty, the nine, the nine six hundred is not, and it's a very similar radio. Mm -hmm. With the any tones, do you have the option of programming from the front panel or making yeah. changes? Yeah, you sure do. Panel? Nice. Yeah, you can actually save channels. That's another thing I never could make work on the TYT. Yeah. I don't know if it, if it was because I didn't have the, the firmware in it, or I, don't, I just never really figured out. <laughs> did they ever make a? Because for the 380, they had the 380 tool. Yeah. Did they ever make a version of that for 2017? Mm -hmm. Huh. And you basically get all that on the Anytone without mm -hmm. doing any hacks. So. Yeah, yeah. quick question um, for myself, and I know there's a couple other people that have decided not to use Windows. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming that the, the software from the manufacturers is probably Windows only, but that contact manager does it run on any OS other than Windows? Uh, so maybe Mac or Linux, or is it Windows only? I think, I know he's had some people ask about it. I don't know that he's done it yet. I think one reason why he said something about he uses Visual Studio, mm -hmm. and that's more Windows. That's definitely Microsoft. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. You can always run an emulation on your Linux computer, can't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> does it run under Wine? Pro pro probably on my Mac, yeah. because my, my, my Linux computer that I've got now is even older than my Mac. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> VirtualBox VMware, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I run on my Mac, things. I run Windows programs yeah. on Yeah, it, it's Windows. Yeah, I mean, it, would, it, would, it would be a huge We could have a whole other discussion about that. Yeah, the, the <laughs> issue with, with virtualization there is, is if you need to access a serial for yeah. the real hardware, then it can throw you timing issues for programming, and then you brick things. Yeah, but then I could like throw Windows on an external hard drive, and could I? Yeah, if you boot it natively. That's how you have mine. Or like on the Mac, I could just boot camp. Yeah, that's how I have mine. Does boot camp do com ports? Uh, when you when you do it through boot camp, you're using all the hardware like it's yeah, Windows a native computer. Windows computer. Yeah. If you have a VMware workstation, it's pretty much real time. There's no, no yeah. lag. We use that in the data center all the time. It, it, in fact, yeah, it was... It, it um, passes through pretty well, except on some really old stuff I tried to use it with. And by really old in, you know, like tech terminology, I mean over five years old. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> um, it uh, it still had some hiccups with certain radios. Right, it probably so. wouldn't want to use like DOS based versions <laughs> programming yeah. software. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I have a laptop for, <laughs> well, for that. Well, the, the the fun thing was whenever uh, they were having so much issues with Vista when it first came out, PC World actually did a test, and the best computer that they could get it to operate on until they ironed the kinks out was actually a Mac running it through boot camp. I have a whole server desktop for Windows and Hamrate so much. Oh, it's only for the PYT works. What's that? Uh, don't get it. I 
Yeah. So, yeah. That's what <coughs> I'm doing. That's exactly what you're looking at. And let me fun. warn you ahead of time with the TYT 9600. They're kind of hard to find. I bought one of them. I pre bought one of those and waited like five months to get it. And it was a Model 1. And I got it. And uh, it had weird issues like the popping sound every time someone was keyed. And it was super loud on the beeps. And there's all sorts of problems. I went through a few sellers and I'm like, which model is it? And they go, I don't know. I'm like, I'm not buying it. Yeah, no, I'm not buying it. I do I not buy it. I know we're on those things. But yeah, I, I actually took mine apart trying to find a way to do it. And I couldn't find a way. Mm. <laughs> not, it's got a really small ribbon cable. It's, um, so yeah, the story. I, and then I bought a model too. In the in the meantime, so I had two of them. And then I uh, was reading on the internet where people were sending their radios back, and TYT was upgrading from model one to model two. Like, okay, cool. So I sent mine back to China, and like six weeks later, it showed back up as a model three. <laughs> so I so now I have a model three, and I sold my model two. And the model three is a pretty good radio. I haven't really had any problems with it. So just make sure you get a Model 3. And right now, they're, uh, they're not 250 now they're 280 the last I saw, if you can find them. They're, they're kind of hard to find. I think they've, geez, I don't know. I mean, the guy, I bought mine from Grapevine, Amateur Radio down in Texas, and he was sending them over by the pallet, getting them replaced. So I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah they're now, hard to find. Associated Radio in Kansas City, at our ham fest, and Nick's a, uh, not this year, but last year, was selling the TY the Model Twos, and people were asking what model number it was. Oh, there's no difference. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? There was a difference, and he refused to do anything to send. He wouldn't send it back or anything. So, just Ooh, buyer beware. Buyer I mean, beware. Because um, I don't know what he's got now, but he had a left ear by hanging in the bottom. I didn't really like that. Uh, Any tones promising their dual band remote head mobile radio this year. So. I think it would be worth it. If you're going to look at a DMR dual band, I'd probably wait for that. What's interesting is the Alenco uh, DMR mobile they're selling now, it looks a lot like the Anytone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure. I don't I haven't bought one, but it, it looks a lot like I it. wonder how expensive the new Anytone is going to be, though. I'd say probably close to $300 range, yeah. if I'd guess. Since the TYT is a $279, I'd say probably be close to that. Just looking at it, it looks like it's going to be a better built radio. <coughs> now, the nice thing about the Chinese DMR radios like Anytone and TYT, they have been pretty good to listen to the customers, so to speak. Um, they've actually made some firmware changes. You know, Chuck up at uh, Bridgecom, before he even worked there, uh, he was testing radios and he was AI hey, needs to do this or that. And he's got a direct line to one of the engineers at. Um, any tone now. I can't remember what the guy's name is. Something odd, of course. But <clears throat> anyway, you know, I've emailed you know Yesu and Kenley before. Actually, does anyone remember the old uh, TM seven forty two that Kenley used to make? The tri band radio that had that looked like the tornado R uh, S meters and everything. You could split the display in half. And I emailed them. I don't know how many times. Can you make something to replace that radio? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. We're just gonna make what we make. So. Uh, they, you know, add a feature to a radio. Uh, they've been really good about adding, uh, like the databases is a big example. You know, when they first came out, you could only have so many uh, aliases in your call sign database, like a thousand or something. Well, now you can put like a hundred thousand in these radios. So that's the nice thing about that. Uh, repeaters. This is that XPR that you guys have back there. Is a twenty-five. It's a they say it's a 45 watt repeater. It'll work that way for a while. <laughs> so, um, I would kind of, 25 or 30 watts is about the max you want to use on those. It'll last forever. And we get ready to do that. There's a, a mod that we can do to the fan. You cut the brown wire and it runs at high speed all the time. Mm -hmm. And it okay. helps keep it cooler. So. Ah, cut the, cut the pulse width. Yeah, you know, cut right. the brown wire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have heard that if you use an amplifier with DMR, that it has to be specific because of how fast the. Yeah, class A, B is what they say yeah. to use with it. Uh, what we found is that the, the, the 55 watt repeater, the UHF one, is about a pretty even match. The 25 watt will hear better than it gets out a little bit, but it's not really that noticeable. And then uh, the Ozark repeater is one of the 100 watt ones, and it's, it's an alligator. It gets out better than it hears. So, really, there's not really much of a reason to run more than 50 watts. 
as if you want it to be matched up to where you can get out to versus uh, where you can hear the repeater. Uh, your duplexer, uh, this is this is kind of left over from, uh, I did a presentation on Joplin last year about this time, and they were trying to figure out what they wanted to use for a repeater, so you already have a duplexer. Um, the old digital TV, buy your digital TV antenna. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to have a digital duplexer, they're all the same, so if you have an analog duplexer, it's going to work. I'm going to put labels on mine. Then. Put digital duplexers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just worth, mess worth with people. Yeah. They're worth more. <laughs> and then the cop rod antennas, um, they give ham discounts. They're built really well. Uh, you try to promote the DB antennas. The cop rod is what you guys have on six four now. So if you've seen that okay. on the tower, uh, they're phenomenal <coughs> built. So and that they're cheaper than the DB two twenty fours and DB four twenties by several hundred dollars now. So with, with that one, it, it's probably going to wind up being a DB four zero eight. Okay, that, that's what we've got. That'll be good. So. The 408s are good because there's no phasing harness connector. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a plug and go. Yeah. How much are those antennas running? Uh, <laughs> if the comp rod, if you get the two bay, which is equivalent to um, the DB224, which is the four bay, they're about $600. If you buy the four bay, which is the equivalent of the DB228, which is the eight bay, that, like they have on the 49 repeater, those are about $1,300. Mm -hmm. So. And then you have shipping from Canada, which yeah. is oh. actually it's not that bad. About 150 bucks on a freight truck. I mean, I've sent boxes that cost more than that to ship. So <laughs> well, 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 and, you know. I'm assuming that these are probably heavy antennas, so that's oh, probably yeah. not a bad uh, shipping price. Yeah, the one, the four bay was 24 foot long and weighed <coughs> about 60 pounds. <coughs> and, and it's it's not even really the weight so much as the size, the sheer yeah. length they yeah. have to accommodate. Very awkward to ship. Well, there's ice on the ground too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess we got that. Uh, it's something else to keep in mind uh, with the software. The nice thing about the repeater software is, if say you you guys have the repeater software, if someone decides they want to try a Motorola portable or mobile, it uses the same software. So you don't have to have multiple softwares uh, for anything Motorola. All DMR stuff's the same. The cables are pretty similar too. The older ones had different cables, but all the newer ones use just a plain USB to A to a USB B connection. So who doesn't have one of those laying around from an old printer? Or printer something. cable. Yep. So uh, don't ever use the LMR 400 on a repeater. So your patch cables. Uh, the reason for that is, and you may be familiar with it, tin diode effect. You've got your different uh, your your braids are dissimilar metal, so mm -hmm. over time they break down and you hear the popping and cracking on your receiver. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. <laughs> so instead, RG214 or 393, 400, 142. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's double shielded and uh, it's made for duplex use, so you won't have any problems with it. <laughs> and here's this kind of gets to what you're asking about how these are the, the cost of the antennas. Um, we're actually going to put one of the uh, the four bay ones on the old fire repeater. Mm -hmm. We just got it last Monday, so we'll see how it works. Any other questions? Uh, I try to cover just kind of some of the basics and give you some things to think about. We, you know, we could have covered the other things way more in depth, but I didn't want to bore you with software-related stuff. I yeah, could could be a catch the whole conversation. It sounded like you were going to make this available in PDF. Yeah, we can do that, and then however you want to distribute it. If you have a put on a file section on your website, or you have a we, on your email, yeah, or Facebook, or whatever. Yeah, we've got several possibilities, so we can make sure that everybody can see it again, because okay. it is even it is a lot to cover. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it is a lot, but at the same time, I felt like um, you kind of need to know the whole broad spectrum. You know, it, you just you have to once you kind of see that there's a lot of moving parts to it. I don't, I don't want people to get um, discouraged from trying DMR because it's a lot of new stuff. And like I was telling someone earlier, you know, the whole time slot, color code, all that kind of stuff, it was uh, very confusing to me at first. And it's like, okay, so I have to use this time slot. Do I have? What about the person I'm talking to? 
if they're across the country, they can be on a different time slot. I thought at first, you know, you had to be on the same time slot, same everything, but no, you don't. So it's all very dynamic. As long as you're on the on a talk group on your radio and they're on the same talk group on their radio, the rest of them in the middle doesn't matter. So it's, it's unless specific. you're on the same repeater, then you have to yep. be on the same time slot. So. That's why I was going to say it's specific to the repeater you're using and the one they're using, and it just meshes yeah, in between. Well, the magic the cloud. Takes care of that. Yeah. Is it a, a standard with Grandmeister? Because I know Chuck and Backyard Repeater Group are very adamant about having their talk group on yeah. that channel, or you know, uh, the yeah. second channel. Would you consider basically your local repeater traffic would be usually on top on time slot one, and then if you are going to try to talk to someone, say across the United States, you want to use top group two or the one, time slot yeah. two. Um, usually, whichever time, whichever top group you think is the most important or the busiest, you want to have by itself. Um, our example, you know, we use Southwest Missouri and Southwest Missouri Skywarn on time slot one. We figure if one's active, the other one's probably not going to be. Those are our most important. The ones where we have URG, we just that's our choice. No one made us do it. It's just a lot of people like that talk. So we keep it by itself. Mainly we put on time slot two because they put on time slot two and it just makes it simpler for everybody. They know they have URG time slot two. So you can put that on your radio and not, it's not as confusing. You don't think, oh, I'm in Joplin, now I need to be RG on time slot one, and oh, I'm moving to Mount Vernon repeater, and I have to be on time slot two. And it's just more to keep it simple, keep it organized. Now, these radios have the ability to do it. It's kind of like a roaming. Do you recommend, or just, or I guess? So the roaming, um, the new Anytones will actually, is the only other radio on the market that will do roaming besides <laughs> Motorola. And the only repeaters that do mo uh, roaming are the Motorola repeaters. And we have that shut off because of beacons, like every so often. And it's just wearing tear on the repeater. And if someone's listening on a scanner, this is how we found out about it. It's annoying. <laughs> so, because there are scanners that will listen to DMR. And there's actually people who use them to do that. So, okay. yeah. I have heard there is some kind of like private person to person <coughs> that's normally like disallowed. Private calls? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's totally up to the repeater owner. But yeah, you could do a private call. You can type in someone's DMR ID and talk directly to them. But it's not private. Anyone that's listening to the repeater with one of those radios in um, modern mobile will hear it. So yeah. it's, it's not just, encrypted or anything like that. It just kind of doesn't show up on other people if they're not purposely <coughs> right. open everything. If they're not in modern mode, they may see the busy light on their radio and their S meter go yeah. up. That's but probably why people don't like it. Yeah. 